As disciples, we try to live each day in response to God's love by following Jesus. A Methodist way of life is a way of growing as a Christian by reflecting on our faith journey and living out our faith. It's an encouragement to worship through prayer and looking and listening for God in scripture and the world, caring for our neighbours and God's creation, challenging injustice and sharing our faith with others. A Methodist way of life is for everyone who wants to take up God's invitation to follow Jesus and live in a God-centred way. Don't worry if that feels a bit heavy. This is an encouragement to do the best we can, knowing we might fail sometimes. But we are committed to doing this together and with God's guidance, helping each other grow into the people God wants us to be. A Methodist way of life is like a plant trellis in a garden, a support that guides us as we grow and flourish. Lots of us, maybe most of us, get a little nervous when we hear the word change or conflict or growth. For those of us who follow Jesus or are on a spiritual path, these are important things to live out. But we can get a little stuck sometimes, especially if we think we have to do everything all at once or everything all by ourselves. I'm Trey Hall. I'm the Director of Evangelism and Growth. Our team is here to join with you and with your community as we get unstuck together to confront the challenges, to open up to God, and to take the next right steps. Not every step at the same time all by ourselves, but the most important steps for this time together. And that way, over time, we can become the people and the church God is asking us to be. Inclusive, evangelistic, justice-seeking, growing. Check out our website for all the ways we can join in with you and get in touch with me directly with your questions and your ideas. Have you ever wondered if God is real? but haven't looked to the church for the answers. The Methodist Church gets that, and that's why we're beginning new Christian communities, exploring being church in a different way. They're emerging in forests and cafes, amongst recovery communities, in universities, in new towns. Kitchen tables host people who are exploring ancient faith. 
I'm Matt Finch and I'm supporting those people who are imagining and creating new places for people who are spiritual but not religious. To find out more visit our website or get in touch with me directly. Good morning folks, welcome to Livestream Worship. It's really good to have you with us this morning. Uh, once again, our service today is recorded, uh, but uh, it's not been a dress rehearsal for us. We've been worshipping and praying as we have uh, prepared our prayers and as we have selected our readings. And I'm pleased to say that Stephen Halford will be offering his reflection today. Once again, this recording is primary for those who can't make church because they are perhaps unwell in themselves, get better if that's you. If they're caring for others, God bless you in your caring if that's the case, or if they're working shifts, or indeed if your family life is really hectic at the moment. So we realise that people catch up and certainly what's offered here on live stream is of great benefit. It's once it's there and recorded, it's there forever really. A whole amount of resource to um, for us to kind of uh, celebrate and draw from. Um, so there may well be folks who are watching afterwards in uh, catch up. So welcome to you again. Our service today is based around our gospel reading and our epistle reading for today. Uh, the gospel reading is the teachings of Jesus uh, in Matthew's gospel. Uh, Matthew's gospel is written to a predominantly Jewish audience. And so there's a clear summary, an ordered summary of some of Jesus's teaching. And what's interesting here is... Um, the thrust, the spirit of the law under the letter of the law. What does the law actually mean? And Jesus brings great clarity. And uh, very often life is more complex and the options that are placed before us, there seems to be no win. But uh, the readings here just lend uh, us the opportunity to think, well, what's the basic principle at work as we live our lives? Uh, the reading from Corinthians is is quite challenging. The Apostle Paul uh, speaks to the Corinthian church. They're a mature church. They're existing in a really challenging environment with a whole mix of values that surround them. And Paul is uh, quite critical, but critical because he wants to see them flourish. Um, there is something of uh, the cult of personality at work in the Corinthian church here. You know, who's your favourite preacher? Who's your favourite minister? Who do you like on live stream? Or who wouldn't you watch on live stream? This kind of thing. Although they didn't have live stream back then. But you get my point. And there's another teacher there, Apollos. And Paul sort of comments about how people are focusing on the personality around the teacher. But actually, and even the arguments. But forgetting the core thing, which is that Jesus is at the centre and uh, we are all called to build the church together we're all equal and uh, yeah I think that's the key message keep Jesus at the center of all things so yes welcome to live stream do join me in a prayer as we begin don't forget to put those comment sections in and thank you once again uh, to Stephen in advance and also to Simon who now they will be there in the background supporting as administrator so do pray with me lords we offer you this act of worship be with us wherever we are we thank you for our live stream community for how we're connected together in different places for the depth and honesty that we're able to share with each other be with us as we worship this morning be with us as we write our prayer requests in uh, be with those congregations that are meeting in other places as well lord if possible bring us to the point where we can meet with other people in churches face to face. Uh, but for the moment, Lord, be with us and touch us in this place and shape us into the people that you're calling us to be. In Jesus' name, amen.
This reading is taken from Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 to 9. As a matter of fact, my brothers and sisters, I could not talk to you as I talk to people who have the Spirit. I had to talk to you as though you belonged to this world, as children in the Christian faith. I had to feed you with milk, not with solid food because you were not ready for it. And even now you are not ready for it, because you still live as the people of this world live. When there is jealousy among you, and you quarrel with one another, doesn't this prove that you belong to this world, living by its standards? When one of you says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, Aren't you acting like worldly people? After all, who is Apollos? And who is Paul? We are simply God's servants by whom you were led to believe. Each one of us does the work which the Lord gave to him to do. I sowed the seed, Apollos watered the plant, but it was God who made the plant grow. The one who sows and the one who waters really do not matter. It's God who matters, because he makes the plant grow. There is no difference between the one who sows and the one who waters. God will reward each one according to the work each has done. For we are partners, working together for God, and you are God's field. And so for our prayers of confession, I'm going to draw on Paul's letter to the church in Corinth here, or the extract, just to help us align ourselves with God's purposes to become the best version that we can become of ourselves in God and that we might be part of something bigger as we build the church together. Lord, we read that we are your servants you call us to work together. Forgive us for the times when we forget our place. Forgive us the times when we forget you. Forgive us the times when we're more interested in our own self-interest than serving others. We acknowledge that you call us to build your church, not our church. That we might have our likes and our dislikes but it's your will that counts. Forgive us, Lord. Lord, forgive us our lack of discipline at times to anchor ourselves in your scripture. Forgive us the times when we forget you, but also we forget to pray. We forget the importance of study and understanding what it is that you're saying to us. Give us a hunger, we pray, for the scriptures. Give us a hunger for understanding. Give us a hunger to delve deeper and understand the principles by which you work. As we hear the teachings of Jesus, help us to understand the values of the kingdom. And for those times when we lack discipline, and we prioritise other things, for the times when we feel we're too busy to pray, forgive us, Lord, and help us to to centre our lives on you, to find ways back in. Put us with people, we pray, who will strengthen us. Lord, forgive us, we ask. And for our shallow, our shallow thinking in how we rate others, of how we put personality above all things, of how we have our favourites in church. Lord, break that within us that's contrary to your gospel. 
help us to remember at all times that we're not here to follow people as such we're here to follow jesus we're here to follow you and help us to persevere with those who we don't naturally engage with help us to take that time lord to think what is it that they want to say to us that they feel as that you have led on laid on their heart and that let's not have our favorite preachers or our favorite ministers let us just be centered on you and help us to grow into the people you're calling us to be we thank you for your goodness we thank you for your grace And we say together the Lord's Prayer. And once again, as is our tradition on live stream, I'll say the first few lines and then we'll complete the prayer together. And I encourage you to write Amen in the comments when you finish saying the prayer for yourself. So, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. A reading from Matthew 5, verses 21 to 37. You have heard that people were told in the past, do not commit murder, 
anyone who does will be brought to trial. But now I tell you, whoever is angry with his brother will be brought to trial. Whoever calls his brother you good for nothing will be brought before the council. And whoever calls his brother a worthless fool will be in danger of going to the fire of hell. So if you are about to offer your gift to God at the altar, and there you remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar, go at once and make peace with your brother, and then come back and offer your gift to God. If someone brings a lawsuit against you and takes you to court, settle the dispute with him while there's time before you get to court. Once you are there, he will hand you over to the judge, who will hand you over to the police, and you will be put in jail. There you will stay, I tell you, until you pay the last penny of your fine. You have heard that it was said, do not commit adultery. But now I tell you, Anyone who looks at a woman and wants to possess her is guilty of committing adultery with her in his heart. So if your right eye causes you to sin, take it out and throw it away. It is much better for you to lose a part of your body than to have your whole body thrown into hell. If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is much better for you to lose one of your limbs than for your whole body to go to hell. It was also said, anyone who divorces his wife must give her written notice of divorce. But now I tell you, if a man divorces his wife for any cause other than his unfaithfulness, then he is guilty of making her commit adultery if she marries again. And the man who marries her commits adultery also. You have also heard that people were told in the past, do not break your promise, but do what you have vowed to do to the Lord to do. But now I tell you, do not use any vow when you make a promise. Do not swear by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by earth for it is a resting place for his feet, nor by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the greatest king. Do not even swear by your head, because you cannot make a single hair white or black. Just say yes or no. Anything else you say comes from the evil one. Amen.
are told we have a service economy and we all like to receive good service. The other week we went out as a family for a family lunch and commented how good the young waitress was and what great service we received. But the thought of being a servant wouldn't appeal to many. I wonder why. Is it that we see the role of a servant as a lowly one and would rather be served as it puts us in a higher position? Is it that we don't know how to serve? It's something we've never done. Do you watch Call the Midwife on the BBC? The other week, Matthew Alwood, Trixie, one of the young midwife's wealthy love interest, was challenged by his father that he had not done a real day's work in his life. So he went and got a job, helping housebound people to take a bath. Remember, this is the East End of London in the 1960s, so not many would have bathrooms, so they had to take the bath and the water with them. A wealthy man, of standing, who chose to wash those many would rather just ignore, was quite something, a real eye-opener for him. If your mind is like mine, you might have thought of Jesus washing his disciples' feet at the Last Supper, the Master taking the role of the lowest servant. In today's reading, Paul uses the word servant twice to describe himself and Apollos, servants in God's field, the mission field, sowing and, and watering for the kingdom of God. Neither role was more important than the other, and both were little compared with what God was doing. But for me, the key phrase was they worked together in verse 9. They served together. Any task is made easier when it is shared. Not just easier, but more rewarding and satisfying. It was no accident that Jesus sent his disciples out in pairs. So what is it to serve? Well, I see it as responding to someone's needs. I do wonder if we're always good at seeing a need. We may see what we think a need might be, but in reality it's not the most pressing thing for that person. In the Bible we hear many stories of Jesus not ploughing in with a healing or a miracle. He takes the time to stop and ask what the person's need is. You may think if you've got a blind man standing in front of you, his need is obvious. Yet Jesus took the time to get to know that person and their needs. Is that not part of, a, of serving? Taking the time to really see and hear the person or the people you hope to serve. It's so easy to fly headlong into something thinking that we know all the answers only to find we're totally wrong. How often do we say to somebody, how are you? And we hope we get a, I'm alright thanks. But we don't have the time to hear all their woes. Is that really seeing that person? For so many the greatest gift we can give them is a small amount of time. I'm sure you've all heard it said that for a child, love is spelt T-I-M-E, time. Are we any different? On the other side, how often are we asked, how are you? Oh, I'm fine, when really we're not. Do we give somebody else the chance to serve us? How can they if they don't know our needs? But that takes honesty and allowing ourselves to be vulnerable. And that takes time to come to that place. In the early church, people like Paul would spend many months in a place getting to know the people. We can often get the impression that they were there five minutes, planted a church, and off they went. Serving others takes time and commitment. I think sometimes the church, we look for a, a quick result. Something that happens. Sometimes it happens, but sometimes it takes years to serve others. Are we looking for a quick fix? Or are we in for the long haul? Whether we are serving our neighbours, or those we are seeking to serve, or serving God 
himself. In serving others, we are really serving God. Jesus said that he came to serve, not to be served. If Jesus, God in human form, came to serve, what should our response to be? Should be to those in need. Let us pray. Loving Heavenly Father, who came among us to serve, may we see where you are still at work in this world, ministering to those in need. Help us to have your heart of compassion and to see with your eyes. Help us to give of ourselves to meet the needs of others in time and effort. Help us to follow you, our servant King. Amen.
And so, folks, as we move to our prayers of intercession, I draw from our gospel reading. Thanks, uh, Stephen, for everything that he's shared thus far. And we move on, we focus on the readings, and there are some quite clear headings here. Anger, adultery, a divorce and oaths. And so we pray through these areas. Lord, uh, we pray for those that we know who are consumed by anger or wrestle with anger continually help us to discern the difference between righteous anger and anger that has no justifiable base we pray and acknowledge that there are times when anger can actually result in positive action we also pray for forgiveness and peace we pray mindful of our deepest attitudes help us to see clearly and to step away from hypocrisy help us to live our lives by example we pray for areas of the world where there is conflict we pray for the people of Ukraine and Russia. We pray for the people of North and South Korea. We pray for the people of China and Taiwan. We pray for the people of America and Britain and those in the European, in Europe. As we continue to think about how we can work together for the common good and be bearers of peace. We pray for the Ukraine that, yes, the war would cease, that both sides would observe the Geneva Convention and that negotiations would continue. And we pray, especially at this moment, as we read about the need to come to terms quickly with our accusers. Lord, we pray for all of those people who are in the midst of a conflict that could grow, that you would give them strength and grace. We pray for the prophetic voice of the church and those who lead us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And as we survey the teaching on adultery and divorce, we pray for all those who are experiencing relationship difficulties. We pray that you would help us to seek out holy relationships in that we and others flourish. As we are mindful of the teaching on adultery, we pray for those who are faced with temptation wherever their eye looks we pray particularly for the rise mindful of the rise of pornography and its accessibility on the internet and the way that it opens the window to other forms of abuse and objectification that lies at the heart of abuse We pray for those who are struggling in their personal relationships that your blessing would be with them as they seek to be honest with themselves and with others. We pray for a resurgence in that determination to seek out what is wholesome in our lives. As we think about your teaching around divorce, we pray for those who are immediately feeling stigmatized by these words stigmatized in a way that jesus would not have wanted to intend we pray for those who live with the perpetual guilt of having been failed or failed 
by their own actions in previous marriages. And we pray that above all, as the Methodist Church and the Church of England reflect on the issue of same-sex marriage and blessing, we pray that at its heart, as Jesus outlines in this teaching here, Jesus, your son, we pray that we would be able to discern what is key in the values that we seek to uphold. We pray especially that marriage would be seen as an institution to be honoured and indeed not set upon lightly or carelessly or selfishly. But we pray for all those who yearn to assert their commitment, their lifelong commitment to those with whom they journey. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We pray for the Church of England and the Methodist Church and other churches as we explore what we yearn for in striving towards wholeness in relationships, as we reflect on our values, as we look to treat those who are different with dignity and human rights. And we also pray for the Pride movement and Christians who are involved in Pride here in Peterborough and across the Connection. Lord, as the Church journeys through this period of difficulty, be with all those who seek to bring clarity and honesty and transparency. But above all, help people to know that they are loved by you and those around them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. And Lord, as we read your teaching on oaths, we are mindful of the promises that we make to others in all kinds of forms. We pray for all those who will assert fresh promises this day, this week. We pray for those who are struggling with finance in particular. And those who are battling the increased cost of living and are struggling to abide by the yes, the commitment that they said, for example, to keep up payments. Lord, help us to be a people that are faithful in the promises that we make. Help us to be wise in what we promise others. Help us to live as people with integrity and clarity. And we pray for our political discourse and our media scrutiny here in the UK. We pray for that scrutiny, but we'll demonstrate who it is that we can trust. We pray for our politicians mindful of the tendency for people to distrust what politicians say and the temptation that our politicians are looking for short-term gain for re-election. We pray for all leaders within our local communities and all those who lead by example as those who are younger grow, we pray particularly for our school teachers, our university teachers, and all those who support them. We pray that you would be with them as they seek not only to teach academic subjects, but also to teach decent human values. We pray also mindful of the political landscape elsewhere in the world where there is much distrust and where there is much competition. So Lord, as a church, we, we pray that we would be a model, despite our history of struggle, that 
we would be a model of what it is to be light in a dark world. Help us to be careful with the judgments we make. Help us to be wary of the implications of silence, of not saying anything when we should speak up, and of the dangers of perpetuating attitudes and failing to correct what perceptions people might have. We pray for our individual churches and our individual witness, and we pray also for churches working together. Lord, may we, as we reflect on the Apostles Paul's teaching to the church in Corinth, may, may we always keep the focus on you, on your love, on your vision for the world, and on your vision for your church. May we know our place in that. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. We remember in the silence all those who suffer this day, those who are sick or troubled or grieving. Lord, we offer you to them and we pray that if it be your will that we would be the hands that would bring healing, the words that would bring comfort and the presence that would bring peace. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you for joining us uh, for today. I do pray that our prayers will have been a source of encouragement to you. God's blessing be with you in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. Now, I should notice that there's a change in room routine for me next week. I'm not um, off or away, uh, but um, it is half term. So my uh, duties have changed somewhat. Uh, I am pleased that I'm going to find a time of refreshment. I hope you do too. But Reverend Dale will be uh, leading prayers during uh, the week. And um, we look forward and we pray and give thanks for Dale and his ministry uh, to us. I also suspect that Matt Forsyth will be away. I know that he's given an apology for another meeting that's happening earlier on the Tuesday. So I'm not sure if he's away, but certainly he may well be away from his desk. So... Uh, yes, we give thanks for Matt's uh, ministry and everything that he brings. God's blessing be with you, folks. Don't forget, it's never too late to add a prayer to raise a concern. We'll always pick up on it. And may you know peace as you walk in faith. And may we all together be a people who have the integrity to call themselves disciples of Jesus. Amen.
Amount to your desire. 